Seating is probably one of the earliest forms of furniture that we see in any given society. After all, people want to be comfortable, and at some point you want to sit down. And sitting on the floor is great to a point, but as you know, when you were in kindergarten, you sat on the floor, everything was comfortable, circle time was fun. If you do it when you're 18, 20, 60, well, it gets a lot less fun as you age. So we see the development of seating. The Egyptians are not the first, but they're the ones we're focusing on. Now, the stool was a common form of seating and used for ceremonial use. In the earlier periods, people sat on blocks of stone or timber trunks. Sometimes the stone would be carved into the form of a stool with three or four legs. Sometimes a solid piece of wood might be carved into the form of the stool. But those solid pieces of wood have their own weaknesses to them. They would have broken very, very easily. And so we don't see surviving pieces in that form. Now, early wooden stools employed mortise and tenon joinery and leather webbing. Many had animal legs, especially in the form of cats and dogs, but the animal legs are really, really common. After all, it's the leg to a stool, so why not mimic something around us? Why not add an aesthetic element to it? And that's really what they're doing. It starts as a very decorative element, that idea of let's add legs to the legs of a stool. We will then see the development of the folding stool using an X design. So these dry, diagonal cross pieces will work around a pivot. Here we see a pin running through the center so that this folds and unfolds. We would see a leather or fabric top piece to it. And these become very, very common. First of all, they use very little material, uh, especially the most expensive material that they have in Egypt at the time, which is wood. It's also lightweight and easily moved. So very simple form. If the fabric tears, we just replace it. It's pretty straightforward and that portability is going to be very important because you might only have one or two of these in your home and so you're carting the thing around all the time. There isn't an ancient Egyptian Walmart to run down and get the plastic version uh, of this piece. Now, during the New Kingdom, we start to see that the most popular stool would be a lattice stool with straight legs, mortise and tenon together to the seat rails, stretchers, and lattices. And they're going to do that because they're getting better at the weaving techniques. They're learning the materials that can be used. It also creates something, again, lightweight. We're not using wood for the seat, but we're using reeds, for example, or leather, things that are a little more available. It always comes down to resources whenever you look at these things. What do they have around and what might be rare? You can imagine that in the very upper classes, they would have solid wood pieces simply to show off that they can afford a piece made of a solid piece of wood. We also see uh, curved seat surfaces used with these woven reeds or rushes, pieces like this, where you would have had that seat again in reeds or rushes woven over the surface. And it's the sort of thing that you could maintain for many years. Now, obviously, this version is quite expensive. We see the use of gold and ivory inlay. So we can reasonably assume that this is going to be upper class or pharaonic uh, belonging to the pharaoh in one way, shape, or form. But we see that development over time. We also see these low stools, which are often used as royal footrests for seating. They would be decorated in a number of sophisticated techniques. And the quality and quantity of decoration would be used to indicate status. In this case, this is a pharaonic footrest. And what you're seeing are the Pharaoh's enemies laid out, presumably dead, under his feet. A very symbolic sort of idea with a lot of inlay. We see the use of a lot of gold. And in any society, when you see precious materials, it means it's meant for a god, it's meant for a ruler, or it's meant as a status symbol. And we tend to put more things, more valuable items 
into something that is for a god or religious purpose than we do, for example, for a ruler. And then we put more into a ruler's piece than we would for someone who's simply wealthy and well off. We will also see the development of a chair. Now, obviously, this is not a big jump from a stool. Let's put a back on it. Let's make it a little bit more comfortable. And we see these going back to the early dynastic Egyptians. So before the pyramids, we're talking second dynasty or so. They tend to start out fairly simple. And again, the use of all of this wood becomes a status symbol. The person sitting in it must be particularly important. Now, we will see these high back chairs with animal legs used in the Old Kingdom. By the Middle Kingdom, the chair could be seen with animal legs, and by the New Kingdom, we start opening that back and creating this open or pierced back design where they've cut through uh, the background of the chair. What it does is it makes it more fragile. And as you move away from something that is a very sturdy, functional piece into something more, well, for lack of a better term, dainty, what happens is you risk breakage. Well, who can afford that breakage? Who can replace the chair? And that's the whole purpose behind it. Look, grandma has that really expensive, really dainty chair in the corner that no one's allowed to sit in, and it becomes a status symbol because I can have it. I don't even have to use it, and if I do use it and need to replace it, I can afford to do so. Yes, status symbols are strange things throughout human society, but it tends to have certain themes, and those same status symbols tend to play into our ideas of interior design. We like status symbols around us. We want people to come into our homes and see us as greater than who we are. The Egyptians are doing the same thing with seating that we're doing today with expensive vases or whatever else. 